what makes a narcissist. To deal with and to address the vagaries of life, human beings have developed coping mechanisms. These coping mechanisms vary in terms of the extent of their use, their impact on the user, the impact on others, and the frequency of their deployment. Some coping mechanisms are regarded as healthy, and others as unhealthy. And some may be a hybrid of the two, dependent on the extent and duration of usage. Distancing is a coping mechanism. You may distance yourself from a situation and people, but prolonged and extensive distancing may lead to isolation with the associated problems that such isolation can bring. Short-term distancing can allow recovery, recharging, and the avoidance of an ongoing and harmful situation. Longer-term distancing, which is targeted on one or more chief proponents of harm, can lead to near-complete removal from toxic and harmful influences. No contact, of course, is a coping mechanism, which incorporates distancing as a central tenet of it and is the most effective coping mechanism to apply with regard to your recovery from ensnarement with our kind. Crying is another coping mechanism. The relief of tension, the release of held grief, feelings of misery, often evaporate as a consequence of somebody crying. You may be told to have a good cry, you'll feel better. And indeed, many people have testified to the beneficial impact of doing so, and thus crying achieves release, and often acts as a signal to invite comfort from others. It is a coping mechanism deployed by people to deal with a stressful, worrying, or hurtful situation. Self-harming is a further form of coping. The distraction caused by the painful response of cutting, cutting being just one form of self-harming, enables an individual to relieve the pain of certain other feelings. It achieves a release, a distraction, and also enables that individual to exert control in circumstances where they feel unable to do so, or to the extent that would make them feel comfortable. Self-harming, whilst a coping mechanism, is regarded as a negative form of a coping mechanism. Expression of feelings, being able to talk it out, or air your feelings, is a coping mechanism as well. The ability to talk to someone else who will just listen, even if they offer nothing in response, or even just talk to yourself about how you are feeling, be it generally or in relation to something specific, enables people to experience a sense of release, a lightening of a particular load, and it often brings clarity in terms of understanding themselves and finding a way forward. There are many coping mechanisms that humans deploy. Some are conscious and others occur unconsciously. Narcissism is one such coping mechanism, and it is a powerful and invariably hugely effective one, although, of course, its effectiveness does depend on the school of narcissist and which particular outcome one is having regard to. The outcome of our narcissism is something that is addressed in a separate video. Narcissism must maintain the construct, which is the false self, and imprison the creature, the true self. Collectively, this is the self-defense of the narcissist. The self-defense is achieved through the prime aims, fuel, control, character traits, and residual benefits. Central to this self-defense and the achievement of the prime aims is, of course, control. The narcissist must at all times have control of his or her environment and the people within that environment, which of course includes you. Whether you are a stranger 
an acquaintance, a friend, a colleague, a relative, or a romantic partner, whether you are a neighbor, a date, a sister, a brother, that man from the corner store, or a fiancé, you come within the fuel matrix of the narcissist, and therefore you must be subjected to the control of the narcissist every time you come on the radar, i.e. you enter one of our spheres of influence. This control has to be asserted second by second of each and every day. Each individual second is a new compartment, a new occurrence, new happening for the narcissist. And as each second passes, the need to assert control starts again. Every passing moment must be owned and governed by the narcissist. We must exert control all around us. This has to be complete and total as if the very clouds were tethered by us. Why is that? Because once upon a time, the narcissist did not have control. That lack of control meant the narcissist felt powerless, weak, vulnerable and exposed. The combination of a genetic predisposition towards narcissism and the imposition of a lack of control environment created narcissism as the coping mechanism. These two ingredients, the genetic predisposition and the lack of control environment, combined and gave birth to narcissism as a means for the relevant individual to cope with the world, with the lack of control that the world caused for that individual. Many people have no issue with a lack of control. Others have alternative coping mechanisms. And then there is us, the narcissist. Roughly around one in six of the human population of this planet became narcissists in order to cope with this loss of control. The combination of a genetic predisposition and the lack of control environment together creates the narcissist because it generates narcissism and narcissism is a coping mechanism. Narcissism allows the imposition of control through manipulation, both benign or malign. The imposition of this control sits within the prime aims. The achievement of the prime aims allows our self-defense, and thus we not only survive, we also thrive. There has to be both ingredients. There has to be the genetic predisposition, which might come from one or more parents, or it could come from further back in the lineage. And there has to be a lack of control environment. If you have the genetic predisposition, but no lack of control environment, no narcissist is formed. If you have the lack of control environment, but no genetic predisposition, no narcissist is formed. People believe that abuse is the ingredient in the formation of a narcissist. It's an ingredient, ingredient, yes, but there are these two ingredients in the formation of our kind. The first ingredient is the genetic predisposition. If you will, this is the seed of the narcissism. The second ingredient is the lack of control, and abuse is part, but only part, of that lack of control, and I'll be explaining this further. The lack of control environment is the soil, fertile, which when allied with the seed, provides the basis for the narcissism to grow and flourish. The narcissism grows as a coping mechanism. For some, the soil is there, but no seed ever arrives, and thus no narcissist. For others, there is no soil, but there is the seed. And since there is one essential ingredient missing, there can be no narcissism. The varying combinations instead result in an empath being formed, 
and differing types of empath, or a normal, or someone who is narcissistic, but not a narcissist. And I'll be addressing those combinations on another occasion. Genetic predisposition plus a lack of control at the formative stage of life equals a narcissist. So what does this lack of control environment at a formative stage of life, i.e. childhood between the ages of zero and nine, look like? Here are some of the lack of control environments. Abuse, whether it is physical, emotional, sexual or psychological, any form of abuse towards us amounts to a lack of control. We could not defend ourselves against the abuse, and therefore this is a lack of control over ourselves and over those who meted out abusive harm towards us. The abuse is an act of commission. We were beaten, molested sexually, told we were useless, insulted, etc. Isolation. Whether this was being locked in a cupboard under the stairs, prevented from playing with other children, kept apart from other family members, being not allowed to participate in group activities of any nature, given silent treatments and treated as if we did not exist, isolating and ostracizing us in some form again constituted a lack of control environment. We were not able to control our own interactions. Someone else did this for us and to our detriment. We were controlled by another and thus we lacked control. Neglect. Whilst there may not have been abusive acts of commission, there are abusive acts of omission. Therefore, we were not given a safe environment. We were not taught effectively, be it about the facts, relationships, behaviour, responsibility. We were not emotionally supported. We were not fed, clothed or protected. We were not shielded from an abuser of commission and or we could roam where we wanted. Once again, we were denied control over ourselves because we were not provided with the assets, resources and tools to achieve effective control over our lives. And this neglect which is a lack of control environment, exposed us to hurt, pain, disease, injury, loneliness and or other acts of abuse through commission. The Golden Child Everything we did was lauded and praised. It was invariably held up as a glowing and shining example of brilliance, even when it was not, or the praise was excessive for a valid achievement. This meant we lacked control in the sense of earning achievements in a valid fashion. We had greatness thrust upon us, and without being ready for it, without having earned it, and without appreciating it. Everything came to us too easily, and this also then amounted to a lack of control. We had no control over the outcome from our endeavours. We felt no compulsion to achieve and apply endeavour, because whatever we did, bad, mediocre or good, was met with accolade, praise and the lavishing of, how brilliant! We were denied the ability to control our own destiny. Shifting sands. When we experienced shifting sands, we had a lack of control because the environment around us at that formative stage lacked constancy. One day the sun shone, and the next day, even though everything else appeared to stay the same to us, there was a thunderstorm. On Monday our painting was declared to be Rembrandt in the making, a la Golden Child, and by Friday our painting was the work of a moron wielding a potato for a paintbrush. The application of black and white thinking by the aggressor created an uncertain environment, one of push and pull, idealisation and devaluation, and we had no control whatsoever on which version was going to appear before us. There was a lack of control in our lives through uncertainty, unpredictability and those shifting sands. B-graders it's good, but not good enough. You can do far better. You are not trying hard enough. You are letting yourself down, but moreover, you are letting me down. These phrases, and those similar to it, encapsulate the loss of control felt by those who are the B graders. Each time the hill was climbed and the summit anticipated, another hill suddenly appeared. The effort was okay decent enough, acceptable, but never that which met with approval. Keep going, learn more, score more goals, be faster, swim stronger, climb higher, shine brighter. There was never any control because we were never allowed a moment to settle, to cherish that which had been achieved and to reflect. We could not establish our own parameters of achievement and satisfaction, but instead 
we were always beholden to the standards of another, which ultimately proved to be unobtainable standards, and thus we had no control. The facsimile. We were shaped to be precisely like the aggressor. Sometimes this was entirely at the behest of the aggressor, and sometimes we in effect saw how this individual behaved and decided, I want that power also. Usually unconsciously, but sometimes, such as the case was for me, consciously. Whilst you may think it is a conscious decision to copy the aggressor and thus seize power as a form of control, it was not. This was actually a product of the already establishing narcissism, and thus a symptom rather than a cause. Where the aggressor caused us to be moulded just like them, forming our opinions, our views, our behaviours, our likes and dislikes, what we wore, what we ate, where we went, what we did, and in some instances, alongside this, there was an unconscious decision to mimic and copy those behaviours and characteristics, we were once again denied control. Accordingly, whether we came from an impoverished background, a gilded background, a seemingly run-of-the-mill background, any of these environments had the potential to cause a lack of control in our lives. Take this lack of control and add to it the genetic predisposition, and thus our coping mechanism of narcissism was given birth to. Narcissism became our way of coping with the world. Narcissism allowed us to assert control. A lack of control equates to a lack of power. A lack of control equates to being vulnerable. A lack of control equates to being weak. A lack of control equates to being worthless, meaningless and unimportant. When we lack control, i.e. when our control is threatened by the actions of others through the provision of challenge fuel or wounding, this causes us to start to fade and threatens our very existence. A lack of control in the instant returns us to the lack of control that existed all of those years ago. This must never be allowed to happen for too long and thus we were formed from this lack of control added to our genetic predisposition this makes us hypersensitive to any threat to our control in a way that you don't recognize, and that is why so many problems are caused in your relationships with us, because you do things unaware that is threatening our control. Remember, it is not how you see it, it is how it is perceived by the narcissist through this filter of a hypersensitivity to control. In order for us to survive and to thrive, we must never ever lack control, for if this persists, well, then it ends. We must have absolute control. Our narcissism develops with a range of varying manipulations dependent on the school of narcissists that we are to ensure that we assert control through the three assertions of control. We must have this absolute control. And that means absolute control over you, him, her, them. But most of all, you. Thank you for listening.